Good afternoon. I'm Anuj Mehrotra, Dean of the George Washington University School of Business, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this live stream session in the George Talks Business Series. Thank you all of you who have submitted questions in advance. We will also invite you to post your questions in the chat on Facebook and YouTube, and we will try to get include some of these live questions in the interview as well. In March, in the George Talks Series, we are having discussions around diversity and inclusion and the many dimensions of diversity and inclusion means to each of us. And in this spirit, I would like to point out that today is World PTLS Awareness Day. And today is also the day when we are celebrating International Women's Day. And I'm looking forward to the conversation on how to promote attracting, supporting, and advancing women in STEM education and careers. And before I introduce our distinguished guest today, let me first introduce my co-host for today's session, John Lack, Dean of the GW School of Engineering and Applied Science. Thank you for joining us today, John. Thanks so much for having me and, and for the growing partnership between our two schools. Wonderful, thank you, John, again. And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our guest today, Kathy Warden, Chairman, CEO, and President of Northrop Grumman Corporation and an MBA alumna. Thank you for joining us today, Kathy. Thank you for having me. So good to have you. So it's such an honor, Kathy. And but and we we invited you today to talk about the importance of advancing women in STEM, and we will get to that in a moment. But first, I think many in our audience would love to hear about the early beginnings of your career and your career path. Can you talk a little bit about your career journey? Absolutely, I'd be happy to. And it really does have origins at George Washington University. As you noted, I received my MBA from the university in 1999. I had graduated with my undergraduate and went to work for General Electric at the time and continued on to get my MBA as a full-time employee and part-time student. I look back very fondly on those days at George Washington and learned a tremendous amount about how to uh, apply business skills in the work setting by doing my MBA at the same time that I was working professionally. After leaving General Electric, I spent a little uh, less than a decade there, I went to join a startup. It was the late 1990s, and for many who remember that period, it was the dot-com boom, and I left to work with a small company that was helping companies figure out how to use the internet for commerce and other business purposes, and that was a lot of fun. I was consulting with a wide variety of customers in different industries and learned what it took to create an e-commerce business in these various industries. I went on to uh, work in aerospace and defense almost uh, in an unplanned way. I was working with a company that had both commercial business as well as defense business. And post 9-11, 2001, I was asked to begin using some of the skills that I had been applying with our commercial clients in the use of information exchange and information uh, gathering into the intelligence community to address some of the issues that were identified with the 9-11 Commission. And that's what got me started in the defense industry. I absolutely thought that that would be a short period of time and that I would go on to uh, go back to my commercial roots, but I really fell in love with the mission. And so I've spent the rest of my career in different uh, roles, mostly profit and loss responsibility for business operations, and that all culminated at Northrop Grumman with me being named the CEO of the company a couple of years ago. So Kathy, Northrop Grumman, of course, is a, is a well-known company, but could you give us a, a, a quick overview of the company and where it is today and some of the most exciting projects you're working on now? Absolutely. We are 90,000 employees strong, located all around the globe, but the predominance of our employee base is in the United States. We operate out of all 50 states, as a matter of fact, and we build technologies that help the U.S. and our allied partners around the globe promote global security 
and human advancement. And what I mean by human advancement is we work on space exploration, we work on disease control, we work on a number of things that impact the daily lives of citizens who are looking to really advance the state of human understanding and human progress. And we consider global security a key component of human advancement and global progress. So, Kathy, we, we invited you to talk about diversity and inclusion. Let's jump right into it. Uh, I, I want to hear from your lens what diversity and inclusion means for Northrop Grumman. You, I know that uh, Northrop Grumman has been recently recognized as one of the top 25 companies among the S&P 500 for its gender equality performance. Can you maybe talk a little bit about what's, what are the steps that the company has taken towards promoting this gender equality as well? Well, diversity is foundational in our company. It is part of our core values to have a diverse population in our company that mirrors the communities in which we live and work. But there's more to it than just diverse representation. There is a culture of inclusion that means people feel a sense of belonging and respect, no matter who they are, what their background is, what they look like. And that's the work that is done in our company day in and day out to ensure it's well beyond a sense of having someone in the company that looks like you, who's able to succeed and get equitable outcomes, but to yourself feel like you're contributing and belong in our environment. You asked about what have we done to make progress in this area? We've done quite a bit. About a decade ago, we set goals that we established for representation in our company. It was long before most companies were doing such a bold move. And those goals are tied to executive compensation. So they have real meaning and accountability for our senior leaders to drive diverse representation. We also do annual surveys that help us to assess inclusion in those two are linked to our incentive programs. And our goal there is to just continually improve on the culture of our company to create that inclusive environment. And then finally, we have numerous programs inside the company that help us to implement strategies to increase not only the diversity of our workforce, but the diversity of our communities. Because often one of the constraints that we face in having, for instance, more women in technology is that not enough women are pursuing STEM careers or even STEM education as a foundation for a STEM career. Or in the case of minorities, needing to help with various issues in terms of our systems and uh, processes for selecting and promoting talent to make sure that we're getting equitable outcomes. So we've done a lot of work across the organization to understand root causes of these issues and then lay in place programs that help us to attack them. So Kathy, um, the pandemic uh, that, we're, that we're facing now has disproportionately affected some groups. And um, could you tell us about, has, has the COVID-19 impacted the company's um, efforts in creating that culture of inclusion you mentioned? And looking forward, what are some new challenges and opportunities for diversity and inclusion in STEM in a, post-COVID world? Well, John, it's a really important point because the work we had been doing prior to the pandemic had us focusing on issues like women in the workplace and how uh, challenging it can be to balance a full-time career with the role of home life and support to family. But the pandemic really made that even more clear when women have been disproportionately impacted due to the pandemic and the role of now spending more time, not only raising children, but educating children at home as well as being a primary caregiver. And so what we found is we needed to put special programs in place for individuals, both women and men alike, but we found more cases where women needed to avail themselves of these resources for support to childcare, for additional time off, for more flexibility in their work schedules, all of which help for people to really deal with these new challenges that they were facing during the pandemic. That's great. That's 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 so important. And of course, today is International Women's Day. And, and as dean of GW School of Engineering, um, you know, I'd love to hear more from you about about the trends that you're seeing for women representation in STEM and 
Um, and as you know, uh, at GW, we are very proud that 40% of our undergraduate engineering students are women, which is almost double the national average, but is still far, far short of 50%, which is where we should be. Um, what are some factors that contribute to the gender imbalance in STEM? And, and what are some examples that, that maybe you've even uh, um, uh, have experienced um, in your own career and, and more about you know, sort of what Northrop is doing to help with that pipeline, reaching out to, to, to students at, at a young age to, to encourage them to, to pursue STEM? Well, John, let me start by congratulating you on the work that you're doing to create pathways for more women into STEM professions by increasing your representation in the engineering school. You know how important that is to me and that we really view partners like GW in this work that we're doing to enhance the STEM pipeline for women and minorities. What we have found with, in particular, women is that we needed to start earlier in the education system that women were choosing not to follow a STEM pathway even as early as late elementary or middle school. And so we have programs where we are training middle school teachers, over 300 have been through the program, and we've reached over 33,000 students to show them that STEM is accessible to everyone and that it's not something to be afraid of or intimidated by, that we can help develop the skills for learning in any individual in science, technology, engineering, and math, and that there are exciting careers that can come from study in those fields. We also support programs in robotics and cyber competitions like Cyber Patriot, which help to make STEM fun and show students what they'll do with these skills when they actually get into the workplace. And so those are some of the activities that we do in K through 12 that helps to widen the pipeline of students that can get into an engineering program or who seek to get into an engineering program at the university level. But it's also important that we work with universities like yours to ensure that students have success once they arrive in an engineering program and that they matriculate at the same rate as students in other disciplines. And I know that there's a lot of work being done both at GW and other universities to make that the case. So, so Kathy, before, that's great. Uh, and, and I don't wanna be outdone by my fellow Dean in engineering here. So let me also tell you that our global MBA class, our full-time MBA class is 57% women this year, which is actually one of the top programs for, for, for representation of women in a full-time MBA program. But really quite uh, jokes apart, I think in addition to increasing gender diversity in our programs, what advice do you have for universities? I know you talked a lot of intentional things that you're doing at Northrop Grumman, for example. Are there certain support things for female students pursuing careers in business? And of course, we have certain programs which are at the, at the intersection of business and STEM in STEM areas that we have launched. But what are some of the things that we can be doing as a university to really uh, not just attract the women, but also support the women to pursue careers in business? Well, one of the most important things is having representation. Studies have shown that when you are the only one in a room who looks like you, your confidence level is lower, your willingness to engage, and that impacts your ability to learn are all lessened. And so the representation goals that you have are a very important first step. And I will tell you that you've come a tremendous way. When I was getting my MBA, the statistics were not anywhere near what you just noted. And that's been deliberate and intentional by setting this as a priority within the university. I think the second thing that's important, though, is just as I talked about in our company, the representation objectives are just step one. You need to add programming that helps you to not only achieve those objectives, but help people succeed in, um, in progression. And within both the business school and the engineering school, there are ways that you can help with creating mentors or uh, just increasing your assistance programs, whether that's through teaching assistance or other types of support to individuals who may run into struggles and need to get access to additional learning and support programs that you can put in place. Those are all the types of things that we do in our business as people encounter challenges 
challenges with their progression in their career, but are also important at the university level as students are challenged so that they don't turn away from an engineering school or a business school to another area that they feel might be more accessible or easier for them to complete. But they are able to stick with it because you're providing support and wraparound services that allow them to move through those challenges. I agree. That is that is so important. And you mentioned that diversity and inclusion is a core value at Northrop Grumman. Um, what are some things that need to be done more broadly to promote diversity and inclusion in STEM and business? Uh, are there public policies that you support or do you see institutions and, and corporations doing enough on their own, perhaps in recognition of the inherent benefits that diversity brings to organizations such as yours? I think it really does need to be organic and owned by the institution as the goal that is top down. The tone on diversity, equity, and inclusion needs to be set at the top. It needs to be established as an objective that has clear ties to business or uh, academic progress. And if that isn't owned by the leadership of the organization, then the progress won't be made at the same rate. So I'm not one for policy or regulation in this area. I do believe it's important to have transparency. And that's where regulation can be helpful in requiring companies or academic institutions to share what their diversity representation is and the steps that they are taking to improve that representation. And that form of disclosure can be mandatory and in some ways is becoming more mandatory for corporations simply as investors are asking for it. Um, so th that's that's uh, really uh, good to hear from you, Kathy. But let me tell you a little bit about what our February sessions were on George Talks Business Series. We spent uh, and George and, and John was talking about how we collaborated on some of these uh, sessions as well across the university, and we were really talking about the responsible use of artificial intelligence. And when when it came down came out to the artificial intelligence algorithms, we discussed a lot and talked a lot around the issues of diversity, inclusion, fairness, and accuracy in AI, transparency, as you mentioned just now, that one needs to be transparent. And from this angle, perhaps, you could share some suggestions for artificial intelligence research for our students and researchers. You know, um, what are some of the issues around AI and diversity that our students and researchers should be exploring so that our algorithms are transparent and that they represent fairly and, 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 and are inclusive? One of the clear concerns with the application of artificial intelligence is bias that might be built in. And we clearly work hard uh, in our organization to make individuals aware of unconscious bias that comes into our own way of thinking. You know, and the way the brain works, there is a tendency toward bias. And so as we take our learning and our uh, approaches, build them into algorithms, it's only uh, it to be expected that those same biases would, might creep into artificial intelligence and that we would need to be mindful of that, both in the way those algorithms are built and then the way that we test and evaluate their performance. This brings up an important point that from an artificial intelligence perspective, many of the challenges are not the technology itself. They're how the technology is governed to ensure that we are maintaining positive control over uh, what artificial intelligence is telling us and that we, especially in this learning phase, are not just trusting the information that comes from algorithms that are developed, but we have in mind the way that we will test and continue to evaluate the performance of AI. And it brings up a whole field in ethics and policy setting around artificial intelligence. And with George Washington being at the, the heart of Washington, D.C., and public policy and lawmakers, it really is, I know, an important part of your consideration in the curriculum around artificial intelligence to always be mindful of what that regulatory framework needs to look like as well. Absolutely, and that is the reason why you know we have been having these collaborations across uh, the university to try and uh, highlight and, and identify 
some of the research that needs to take place in this very important area so that we don't lose control of AI in, in any unethical way and so on. So I appreciate that. You know, you I want to change gears just a little bit, Kathy. Uh, you know, you have, because uh, you, are, you, you, have had, you have been in so many leadership uh, positions um, across, for, you know, I know you have been on different councils and on the board of directors. So to have you I, here, and I would be remiss if I don't ask you, what's, what are some of the leadership lessons, not just for our women in the audience, but also for men in the audience who are watching this session that you would like to think about and talk about? Well, certainly early in my career, one of the luxuries I had was being able to take some risks. I worked for companies that pushed me to challenge myself and step into roles that expanded my horizons, roles that frankly, I might not have chosen to take had I not had that encouragement that I would succeed and that the organization would be there to support me. But that risk taking is something that each individual has to get comfortable with but for me, really helped me to build a strong foundation of confidence to take on new challenges and stretch myself throughout the remainder of my career. As I was mid-career, you know, what I learned is that careers really are a marathon, not a sprint, and that it's not about getting to a destination. It's about picking up skills and building your network all along the way, and that you have to really immerse yourself into the learning that comes with every role and you know developed in me a sense of being a lifetime learner that i wasn't going to reach a destination in my career where i felt the learning was done and now i just you know executed i was always going to be learning i was always going to be expanding my network and i needed to be purposeful and intentional about doing that in each opportunity i had and then as i've gotten a bit later in my career I have really relied on the understanding of the more soft skills of leadership. Things like empathy have been invaluable over the last year. You know, the world has been dealt a major change and in that individuals are feeling very disrupted, isolated from the pandemic, a sense of instability, from social justice issues. And it really requires leadership skills that we often don't think of as what an executive needs to possess. But communication and empathy have been at the core of what we've needed to use to operate through this pandemic over the last year. So, you know, bottom line, different skills at different times throughout one's career. And I have always felt that I'm constantly learning and that if you're open to that, you can get good development out of absolutely any circumstance that you're in, even those that don't seem like the best or the most constructive circumstances, uh, they are really valuable learning lessons. So you, you you mentioned a bit earlier that um, that the events of nine the events of nine eleven had a significant impact on your career. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? And and you know you, you mentioned the, our current pandemic a couple of times. How that might end up shaping um, people who are starting out their career uh, today. Yes, so I was working, as I mentioned, in commercial industries, and then nine eleven occurred, and I had the opportunity to take a career revectoring. And as I said at the time, like most people, I thought I'd go back to what I knew and what I was comfortable doing and what I had envisioned for myself. Because at that stage of my life, I still believed I could plan the future. Uh, how naive, as I realized looking back today. But then I did believe that I had the plan that was all laid out, both for my personal and my professional life. And that included moving back to commercial industries and doing more technology development uh, in the commercial world. But what I found in making that shift was I had a passion 
for what I was doing in the defense industry. And it was a passion that I didn't feel necessarily in working with my commercial clients. Not that I don't want to help companies make money and grow. That was exciting. It is job creating. But there's just a different passion that comes from supporting a global security mission and feeling like you're making the world a safer place. And I truly did feel that the work I was doing post 9-11 could have that impact. It happened to be the year I had my first child. So maybe I was a little more open to the thought of wanting a world and wanting to support uh, the development of solutions that would help make the world safer, particularly in that time from counterterrorism. So it, it was one of those opportunities that I, I had to have an open mind, and I probably didn't have as much of an open mind as I should have, but I, I took the opportunity anyway and learned a tremendous amount, found a new passion, and set my career on a different trajectory as a result. That's wonderful. Well, um, speaking of your career, I understand that uh, you've, you've added another leadership position uh, to, to your activities and that you were recently appoint, appointed as vice chair of the board of directors of the Greater Washington Partnership. So congratulations on that. And can you talk a little bit about the partnership um, and your work on, the, on that board? Absolutely. The Greater Washington Partnership has been in place for several years and is a multifaceted organization that is working in the region. And when I say the greater Washington region, we're talking Baltimore to Richmond to organize our companies, academic institutions, and governments toward positive outcomes for the region. It originally intended to focus mostly on economic growth in the region, so bringing new companies and new industries to the region to create growth in jobs. But it also has expanded now with a increased focus on inclusive growth. And this is addressing the income divide that all major cities have, but that we have here in the Washington metro area as well, between the people who are prospering in this economy and the people who are not. And so I'm really excited about that work. It has spun a number of initiatives that the companies of the Greater Washington Partnership uh, support, including a collab which is a university-based program that provides digital certifications for individuals to get skills and credentials, no matter what their degree program in the digital technologies that they'll need to be successful. And this collab has uh, 20 university partners in the region and a number of companies all coming together to create this structure for digital credentialing in the area. It's just another example of a program that could not be formed by one company working with one university and creating these partnerships and then trying to scale it. But an uh, organizing entity like the Greater Washington Partnership can be that convener. Well, th thank you, Kathy, for that. And by the way, I want to remind our audience, if you have some live questions to submit right now, this is the time. This is your chance. Otherwise, you will be getting to some of the submitted questions in any case. Uh, following up on some of the important work, Kathy, that uh, John asked you about Greater Washington Partnership, I believe you're also a member of the Business Roundtable. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Business Roundtable and your involvement with it? And what is the role of the Business Roundtable um, uh, in here? Mm -hmm. Yes, I am a member of the Business Roundtable, and the Business Roundtable has the CEOs of many of the Fortune 200 companies that are looking to contribute to policies that help businesses to thrive. But when I say policies that help businesses to thrive, there's been really important work done in the Business Roundtable in the last two years to also be more inclusive in how a corporation defines its purpose in thinking about stakeholders more broadly than just shareholders who are and will always be an important stakeholder, but our employees are important stakeholders, our customers are important stakeholders, our communities are important stakeholders. And so we at the Business Roundtable have updated the purpose of a corporation, the definition of that, that we as leaders seek to live 
toward a corporate set of policies that take all stakeholders into consideration when we're making business decisions. And I think it's one of the most important things that the Business Roundtable has accomplished together in the last couple of years. But it's not just a restatement of purpose. It's now permeating that purpose into all of the committee work that the Business Roundtable does on areas like inclusive growth, education, transportation and infrastructure, even fiscal policy and reforms that we might seek there. Thank you so much for your leadership on those really important issues. That's fantastic to hear that you're involved in that. Um, so we have a number of students in the audience and, and what, what advice and, and guidance do you have for them who are seeking internships and jobs? What are you looking for in your new hires and, and are there skills that are becoming increasingly important um, especially during the, the, the during the pandemic and as we move into a post-COVID world? Well, probably the most important encouragement I can give is that many companies are still running very robust internship programs despite the pandemic. We had over 3,000 interns in 2020. We continued with our program. Many of those interns had a virtual experience versus an in-person experience with our company, but still the same quality of opportunities that were given to interns in prior years, and we'll do the same in 2021. So seek internship opportunities. They are still available. The second thing I would say about an internship opportunity is that while we hired, as I said, over 3,000 interns last year, and we hire about 2,500 on average each year, most of them are toward skills that require some level of digital proficiency. So the program I mentioned with the Greater Washington Partnership and the CoLab to have digital certificates at universities, where no matter what you're studying, you graduate with some level of digital proficiency, meaning you can read and interpret graphs, you can understand data, you can understand how to create rudimentary data structures. These things are going to be very important for all skills even if you're an attorney or if you are an accountant, these digital proficiencies are important. And of course, if you're coming to work in a company like ours in our more technical professions, engineering, our sciences, our computer programming, those skills are absolutely essential. That's great to hear. And that certainly is one of the motivations for the partnership uh, between our two schools, between, the, between business and engineering, so that People really are sort of cross-trained in, 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 in all the relevant areas. Um, so in, in talking um, with, with you and with other alumni of GW, uh, one of the things that we, we hear a lot is that graduates today are, are, are much less likely to stay in the same field, much less the same job with the same company for their entire career. Uh, what suggestions might you have for, for students as they navigate the many possible paths their careers will take? Well, it is true that fewer people stay with the same company for their entire career. At Northrop Grumman, because we have 90,000 positions and growing, we do find that many people are staying with our company longer and for you know multiple decades because we offer the opportunity for people to have very different experiences all within the same company. And I think largely that's what people are looking for, the opportunity to learn and grow and expand their impact. And that you can do that either within the same company or by moving from one company to the next. And what you really wanna focus on in my experience is what is each move gaining you in terms of experience, exposure, or education, and that your career will be a journey that you want to be picking up uh, elements of each of those experience, education, and exposure all along the way, and be purposeful in trying to reach a destination in your career, you are going to need to be thoughtful about, am I getting the experiences that will help me get there? Am I meeting the people who make the connections that might help me get there? And am I being a lifelong learner? The other statistic that's important for us all to recognize is that skills today age out in about five to seven years. When I went to college, there was an expectation that you would get a degree and that degree would set you up for life. And for many people, 
prior to my generation, that was indeed the case. They never went back to get additional education, and there wasn't a lot of reskilling required. Their fundamental education had prepared them for their career. Now, however, if you get a degree in a particular area, particularly if it's science, technology, engineering, or math, you are likely going to need to upskill in the next five to seven years, and every increment after that will likely get shorter. And so really it is about lifelong learning learning and finding your avenues for continuing to educate yourself. So, Kathy, this is great. And before we jump to a couple of questions from the audience, both submitted, which are submitted right now or earlier, I want to tie in a couple of questions that John and you just talked about uh, in this discussion. Um, you know, we are also hearing that we need to prepare our students with an entrepreneurial mindset. And uh, with your experience, not just at, as a CEO of a major defense contractor company, but also your past experience in a startup environment, would love to hear your views on how important this entrepreneurial mindset is in today's world for the students to get into. Well, I think it's very intriguing for students to uh, you know, see that a corporation, no matter how big or small, is open to ideas and innovation and recognizes what I was just mentioning, that we have to continue to evolve our business models at the same rate that I was just talking about people needing to evolve their own skills. The world is changing so rapidly that a business model also does not last as long as it used to. And so the innovation cycles are shorter. Our technologies and our solutions are not differentiated for as long as they used to be. So those cycles are shorter. And what that means is that everyone in the organization, and again, this is big companies and small companies, needs to have a mindset of continually innovating and disrupting oneself. And that's particularly important in large companies where you have a very established business model or product that has been quite successful, but knowing when it's time to disrupt yourself so that a competitor doesn't is a critical skill and important for people of all ages and all experience levels to be thinking about as they come into the work world today. Great. So, Kathy, let me let me take care of a couple of questions. I'll try and combine two or three questions into one uh, around the same theme that have been popping up. One, of course, is about uh, you. We talked a little bit earlier about leadership, and the question is about as CEO of a large company, how do you build trust and respect the team that you lead, and perhaps combine that with the idea of during uncertain times as we have been navigating the COVID-19 crisis, what are some of the key principles you wish to share uh, around which you can build this trust, uh, especially when you are delivering sometimes uh, not so pleasant news to your, to your company? And it may not, hopefully it has not happened at your company, but many, many of the leaders have had to deliver bad news to their employees. Well, it's, it's true that you want a foundation of trust at all times, but it's particularly important to have when the organization encounters challenges, because that's when the team needs to come together and have unity the most. And they'll have that unity of trust has been built through the good times to be able to en endure the bad. And what I would say about building trust is one, it's important to be authentic, transparent, genuine, whatever word you like to describe you know, not only being your true self, but allowing the team to be as well. That creates an open environment, one in which people feel comfortable speaking up, sharing their points of view. They feel respected in those points of view. Not that the team is always going to agree, and actually that wouldn't be good. If the team was always thinking alike, that would be groupthink. That's that's the definition. And so you want constructive debate, but you want people to feel respected in the process of engaging in that constructive debate. And that's all about truly feeling that you value people's opinions. And that goes back to the skill set I was mentioning of viewing yourself as a lifelong learner. Nobody 
around the executive table, no matter how experienced they are, what they might have seen and encountered in the past, has the recipe for success going forward by themselves. And so that constructive engagement by the team is always going to make the team stronger. And the leaders have to truly believe that. And if that comes across authentically, the team is much more willing to engage and build trust. Thank you, Kathy. That's asked, terrific. And I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, you asked, what are some of the skills leading through this pandemic that have helped build that trust? Communication. You know, we recognize the importance of communication, and I do mean bi-directional. Communication isn't uh, speaking, it's also listening. And so having ways to get feedback from our employees about what they were struggling with, what barriers they needed us to remove to be able to continue to operate during this pandemic, and allowing them locally to make important decisions that would in fact uh, affect their workplace was really important. Uh, the other was empathy, as I mentioned, not just looking at the near term, how is this going to affect the bottom line, but recognizing this is an investment in people for the long term and that we were going to make decisions that spent more money to make sure our people were safe, that their well-being was taken care of, and that we were able to address some of the hardships that they were facing. And then I'd say the final thing that we learned through the pandemic is the importance of purpose. I talked about how I come to work every day feeling a sense of purpose in this industry that's really important to me. During the pandemic, our people found purpose in being able to help, even in small ways, like donating some of the personal protective equipment that we have to do our jobs, like in 95 masks that we need to work on our manufacturing floor, donating all of that to uh, medical workers because the need was so great a year ago. And we figured we'll replenish. And if we have to slow down some of our activities to get this material into the hands of the people who need it most, that's the right thing to do. And we should always be guided by doing what's right. And our people found real inspiration and purpose in that. And so it's important to, at times when the community needs to draw together, that the corporation contributes to that sense of giving and belonging in the communities where we operate as well. Thank you, Kathy. I, you mentioned authenticity, communication, and purpose, uh, key, 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 if playing a key role in, in during this time and probably any time in the life of a leader. You also mentioned a lot about lifelong learning. And, and, and as deans, I think both John and I have been seeing on how the markets have been evolving, needing more specialized education oftentimes and in fact, there's just a question that has been submitted, which, which is for, for, for your comment, uh, particularly as we move towards this uh, kind of specialized um, education. And the question is for early career professionals who seek executive roles, for example, at corporations like uh, Northrop Grumman, uh, would you recommend an MBA as the path to go? Or would you recommend very specialized degrees on space policy masters, for example, uh, as the path to go? Or is there room for both? And I would just let you answer that question. Um, instead of uh, prefacing it more? I think there's room for both. And here's what I'd say. I would no longer look at degrees as something you get and then you move on with life. I would think of degrees as a way of supplementing your education all along your career journey. And it's also not just for people who want to change from one career field to another, but instead to think of it as, and it may not even be full degrees, it might be certificates, it might just be a collection of coursework that helps to progress your understanding in a specific area, whether it be technology or policy. And the more you can, bring that into your life or your career at the point in which you're ready to apply it, the better off you'll be. I mentioned getting my MBA at the same time I was working full time and I was working in a corporate strategy role that was brand new to me. It was invaluable to have my MBA experience complementing my professional experience and being able to apply what I was learning real time. So I think that what we all should do as we think about education is embrace the thought that we can continue with education and a relationship with the university may not be a one-time or a two-time engagement in our life, but instead a lifelong engagement to supplement our knowledge base. 
So Kathy, you'll be very happy to know that at least at GW, we have uh, uh, taken taken the certificates approach and, and modularized our curriculum around gra graduate master's degrees programs. And in fact, Joy and I are collaborating on some of these certificates to be both at the School of Business as well as Engineering for our students to prepare them appropriately for that. I know uh, we have we are on time, but I have one question here which has been submitted, if I may ask you to, um, um, and this is really uh, to be expected uh, given some question would come up like this uh, when, when we are talking to you. And it says over the past few years, new companies have emerged to get involved in commercial aspects of space. How does this competition affect what you do at uh, Northrop Grumman? And I'll leave you with that final question. Well, it makes us stronger is we see new entrants come into the space market where we have been an established participant. As I said, it drives us to think about how might we disrupt ourselves rather than wait to be disrupted. And it makes all of us in the industry improve our game, if you will, to be able to compete effectively with one another. I don't view new entrants as a threat. I see old thinking and losing your innovative edge as being the threat. And that can happen whether there are new competitors coming in or not. It's about your culture in a company and how you operate. And I feel very confident that Northrop Grumman has been a company built through entrepreneurs and an innovative spirit and will continue to excel because we have that culture inside of our company. Well, thank you, Kathy. It has been an honor and, and really a delightful conversation this afternoon with you. Thank you for taking the time. And thank you, John, for co-hosting this session as well. Thank you. So, uh, thank you again. Uh, so I would like to also thank our audience, by the way, who joined us today and invite you to the next session in the George Talks Business Series. This Wednesday, we will feature a panel focused on Elevate, the GW School of Business partnership with the Coalition for Nonprofit Housing and Economic Development for Executive Education for Local Minority businesses, Business Enterprises. This session will be moderated by Dr. Vanessa Perry, the Dean for Faculty and Research at the GW School of Business. I hope you will join us then. Thank you again.